Dear smartphone companies, two things. The first one being naming. It might seem trivial, but smartphones are complicated. Some companies are making 30 models a year, and visually, a lot of them don't look entirely different. This, of course, makes the naming of them crucial, but some brands just keep messing it up. So there are seven things that I think could be done better here, and number seven being the length. Let's say Apple released a brand new iPhone in the future, and they had two potential names. How much better does iPhone Z sound versus iPhone 12 Pro Max Plus SSS Plus? The name has got to be short. Short is impactful, and short is easily shared. That said, Apple still somewhat gets away with this because they only release one batch of phones a year, and they are so widespread that people kind of get used to them. Their naming. But let me tell you, if Lenovo did this, then I reckon it would fly completely under the radar. It even applies to laptops. How much better does MacBook X7 sound as opposed to MacBook Pro 15 inch late 2018 model? One letter and one number is enough to convey the exact same info as what is almost half a sentence. Number six is that the naming has got to be intuitive. Let me tell you something that does make sense. Let's say Samsung makes three lines of phones. You've got the flagships, you've got the mid tier ones, and then you've got the entry level ones. They could literally call them A, B, and C. A being the letter people already associate with being the best, and it's very clear that phones in the A range are going to be better than phones in the C range. Now, what makes a lot less sense is this. This is Samsung some years ago talking about their different ranges of phones, and apart from Y at the bottom, which stands for young, it's almost impossible to tell which is the best. S is for super smart, and that does sound pretty good, but then R is royal. That sounds even better. W and M are wonder and magical. Where where do they fit in? In trying to make each individual product seem great, you might end up confusing your customer. Here's a story. I was talking to someone last week, and they were about to buy the Galaxy A80 smartphone, which is a really cool bit of kit, but they wanted to check, they just wanted to do a final confirmation that this was indeed the best phone that Samsung offered right now. No, it's definitely not. And yeah, this is going to be obvious to me, it's going to be obvious to you guys, because the kinds of people who are in this tech community, we really understand smartphones. But you can probably also see the situation where, by looking at this phone's front-filling display, its brand new form factor, and the fact that it has the letter A in it, an average consumer might not realize it's barely half the power of Samsung's best. Number five is appeal. Every single time you think about, you hear about, or you interact with a product, you build associations with it. If, for example, people kept telling you, oh, my OnePlus phone is so fast, then you're going to start associating OnePlus with speed. With that in mind, then, if you're going to name your smartphone a Priv or Cha Cha, then right out the gate, a person's first impression is not going to be all that great. A name should have positive associations, and yes, these can be built over time, but a company can also help themselves by picking something that sounds good out the gate. Samsung's Galaxy is a good example. Number four is being something they call web friendly, and this is especially important if you're a smaller or a newer company. Whilst it is tempting to name your brand or your line of phones after something in the real world, it can also result in your brand just not appearing at all when people search for you. Let's take Honor. When I search Honor here in the UK, I do get the brand name coming up first, which is good, but it's also mixed in with a whole lot of news that's got nothing to do with the phone company. There's another company called Lava, and let me tell you, they've got it far worse. They're a fairly established manufacturer of smartphones, but they don't even appear on the front page when you Google their name. I would argue that even more important than this, is pronunciation. You see, there's a distinct psychological effect when someone sees something that they think is unfamiliar or foreign. People stick to what they know, and that applies to the names of phones and the companies that sell them. If you're going to try and sell in the UK, and your brand is called Huawei or Xiaomi, which a large amount of people here struggle to say properly, then it's not impossible, but right out the gate, you're at a disadvantage. This is part of the reason the Honor brand exists, to try and appeal to young Westerners who might be put off by Huawei. So, you don't need telling that a lot of smartphones are getting released, and our best way of keeping track of that is numbers. Oh, you're using the iPhone 7, I'm using the iPhone 8. You can tell very quickly which one is better than the other one. Samsung's Galaxy S series does this pretty well. It's consistent and easy to follow. You've got the S1, the S2, the S3, the S4, and so on. And because the Note series shares the same numbering as the S series, people could very quickly look at the Note 9 and realize it is Samsung's Note equivalent to the S9. It's kind of amazing then that almost every single one of these companies starts to break this rule, but only in some situations. With Huawei's flagship P series, it was absolutely fine. There was a P8, a P9, a P10, but as soon as we thought we were about to see a P11, we got a P20. And part of me gets it. It sounds cooler. 
it signifies a big jump in performance. But to an average consumer, as soon as you start arbitrarily jumping numbers like this, the number itself becomes meaningless. It might as well just be the P900 at this point. What makes even less sense is LG, who counts upwards in ones with their flagship G series of phones, but then decides to count upwards in tens with their other flagship V series of phones. And the most criminal example of this is when companies, completely out of the blue, just name their product One. No prefix, just the number one. Sony comes to mind here, a company with quite possibly the most confusing lineup in history. Let me give you an example of the names of Sony flagships over the last few years. You've got the Xperia X10, Xperia S, Xperia T, and Xperia Z. So at this point, it just seems like the brand Xperia with a random letter attached onto it. But then we had Xperia Z1, Z2, Z3, Z3+, Plus, Z5. And then just when it looks like we're getting somewhere, XZ. They then kept going with X. Z for a bit, and then bam, back to just Xperia 1. And they've also just announced the Xperia 5 to go with that. I give up. Number one is gonna sound pretty self-explanatory, but repeating yourself, giving two completely different products an identical brand name. I was talking to a friend the other day about buying an iPad, and he said, but isn't the standard iPad really old? In an attempt to simplify things, Apple has done multiple iterations of starting from scratch, in the same way Sony has, but with Apple, they're not using similar names, but identical names. I suppose what Apple is trying to do here is sell the iPad as an experience. They're banking on the fact that people trust them. They're trying to create an environment where people will buy Apple products without even making comparisons to other brands. And in that sense, it's quite effective. It just means that the only way to keep track of what you're actually getting when you buy iPad is by diving into the tech specs where you can see which chip they're powered by. Funnily enough, the chips themselves are labeled perfectly and very easy to follow. Anyways, I went on for a bit, but that's my piece on naming. And the second thing I wanna talk about is scratch resistance. Isn't it kind of annoying when you're doing everything to protect your shiny new smartphone and then one day you just pull it out your pocket and bam, there's a massive mark going right across your screen. You might've seen a video I made titled, Are Smartphones Getting Weaker? If you haven't, I won't spoil the full thing, but one finding was that newer smartphones aren't actually more scratch resistant than devices made 10 years ago, or at least not significantly. The issue is that there's a trade-off between adding more scratch resistance to glass and adding more drop resistance to glass. As the Corning Gorilla Glass, the stuff you see on flagship phones each year has progressed, it has become more and more resistant to drops. But because adding drop resistance doesn't protect against scratches, and because smartphone makers are supposedly pushing Corning to make thinner glass each year, scratch resistance has barely improved. And actually, between some generations has gotten worse. Now, I don't have a problem with stuff getting thinner. It can be quite a cool, novel thing, but not everything has to be thinner. And I feel like when it comes at the cost of things like durability, just make the phone thicker. Obviously, you can just put a case on the back and a tempered glass screen protector on the front, but at that point, your device is almost definitely thicker and probably less pretty than if they just added more durability in the first place. What I would personally want is for a phone to have a harder material to coat the display. This can potentially make it more brittle, but then increase the glass thickness or add a protective layer on top to make it stronger. It is possible that this is all part of the business strategy, that having scratched up phones gives people that constant sustained incentive to keep upgrading and buying the latest and greatest. But at the same time, if it is a fixable problem, then it would be really appreciated. So yeah, it's an incredible time to be alive. There's so much crazy stuff happening, and in the grand scheme of things, yes, I am nitpicking. But I quite enjoy analysis videos like this, and if you've watched this far, then hopefully you do too. If you enjoyed this video, I've got a ton of smartphone news like this, so I'll link it somewhere above here. My name is Aaron, this is Mr. Who's the Boss, and I'll catch you in the next one.